Welcome Ari Daniel to Tufts University. So Ari has a, a really, really fascinating history. He's got some strong training in biology that's been, um, many students come and they want to study marine biology. He studies marine, he definitely studied marine biology. He's done work with seals and whales. Um, but that at some point he decided that he wanted to sort of work in film and bringing story to, to us as consumers of science. And, and there's one of the themes of my, in creating the environmental studies program, wanted to create an environmental communications track within the program, knowing very well that if you can't tell a good story, you can't make progress in sort of working on the environment. And I'm so glad that you're able to come here and sort of talk to us about story and, and making a difference. So thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice to be here. Thanks to all for coming out on this gorgeous spring day. Um, so I'm going to tell you, uh, uh, I'm going to share with you a few clips to kind of illustrate the power that I found uh, storytelling and narrative can play in communicating science. And I've chosen most of my examples to focus around environmental science. Um, first, let me give you a, a photo to illustrate what, um, uh, what I used to do. Uh, and that's me in the orange Mustang suit on the right there on board that uh, sailboat. This is in northern Norway. Uh, I used to, this is for my dissertation work. So I studied uh, free-ranging wild uh, killer whales in Norway. We put tags on them. We were trying to understand how they work cooperatively to feed on herring at depth and all of their vocalizations. So I spent many, many hours, days, weeks, months, probably my life, listening to killer whales, not really understanding what they were talking about. And, and then I switched, uh, after defending my uh, P dissertation, my PhD, uh, to uh, interview and record other things in the world, uh, mostly humans, though occasionally I would rec I record um, the sounds uh, in the environment. Here I am in Greenland uh, when I was working on a story related to glaciers and climate change. Um, so, uh, and I made that trans transition about 10 years ago out of science into science communication and science storytelling. So I want to start by playing you the beginning of a clip that um, aired on, it was a radio story that I worked on for NPR. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, um, most of my time I spend at NOVA. I spend about four days a week at NOVA um, as senior digital producer where I make digital videos and also digital interactives online. Um, and then I do a bunch of freelance stuff as well. And so some of what I do freelance-wise is uh, public radio. <clears throat> so this is from one of those public radio pieces. So I cut off the host intro, which is the part where the story gets introduced. And I'm just going to play for you like the first uh, almost two minutes of the piece. I may pause it as I go. It's a couple hours after sunset, and everyone's donning a wetsuit. Zippers yank clothes against bare backs. In minutes, I'm standing among 15 to 20 dark figures in a graveyard on the west coast of Guam. Somebody has, has a life. They're not here for the tombstones. No, they've come to help rescue something else from dying in the waters nearby, the corals. Okay, let's go. Dirk Peterson is easily the largest person in the group. It's going to be the night, guys. Spawning time. Spawning is what happens when corals have sex. The reefs we see are actually colonies of millions of tiny animals, and in a single night they cast a fog of sperm and eggs into the water, some of which fertilize to make baby coral larvae, and some of those larvae settle back onto the reef, making it grow. Peterson is the founder and executive director of an organization called CCOR, which stands for Sexual Coral Reproduction. His mission is to gather sperm and eggs from the corals, fertilize them in the lab, and return the baby corals to the wild. Think of it like IVF for the reefs. The team divvies up the collection containers and heads to the beach. Everyone's getting their snorkel ready, sharing lights so they can see what they're doing, and wading out into the water. I thought... I'm going to pause there for a second. The reason I wanted to play this story for you, so most radio stories that air on NPR are usually like three to four minutes, so they're like, they're almost kind of haikus, you know, they're really condensed things. 
So, um, so you can, uh, I wanted to illustrate a bunch of points and, uh, with this one. So first of all, I don't start the story by talking about corals or about how they're in danger or they're not faring well. Now the host intro that I, delete, that I didn't play for you, they do set that up. But often when I'm starting a story, I really try uh, to avoid um, uh, giving away perhaps what the story is about initially, and I try to set up a little bit of mystery. Uh, in this one, we, we open on a, a near a graveyard, and people are putting on wetsuits, and the, there are sounds of the wetsuits being put on, and so hopefully people are are kind of curious about what it is they're listening to, uh, and they're and it's a, and it's a kind of an interesting visual scene of people in wetsuits next to tombstones. Uh, and then, then, I, then about 30 seconds in, maybe I talk. I first talk about the corals. Um, the guy Dirk Peterson, who's one of the lead characters in the story, uh, we first hear from not as the founder and head of Seacor, but just as the tallest guy in the group. Um, you know, and he says uh, he says something about his flashlight or headlamp or something. He's not even saying. He's just it's just a, a part. He's part of the scene. He's part of the backdrop. He's a character that's kind of coming into view. <clears throat> and so then, once I, I hopefully set up some interesting image at the beginning, then I, then I talk about coral spawning. And Kirk, uh, Dirk says, you know, uh, tonight might be the night, guys, and it's about spawning. Then it kind of lets me talk about coral reproduction. And I, what I've done is I've kind of hopefully bought myself a little bit of time to give the listener information. So, I, I could have opened with, uh, it's like, this is, um, let me tell you about coral reproduction, but there's nothing motivating it. So what I wanted to do is tuck the information later in the story, when hopefully the listener is either interested in listening to the information or is willing to wait through it to get to more of what hopefully captured their interest at the beginning. Like, yeah, 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 okay, they reproduce, there's, there's sperm and egg in the water, okay, they're doing IVF for the reefs, but back to the story, back to the scene. And so all of this story is taking place on location, in scene. And when I can, these are the stories that I, I, I really love trying to figure out how to tell the whole thing on location. Because I find it to be just a, it's like a movie set, you know, where it's all taking place with props and there's a backdrop and there are characters and there's a score, you know, it's like it's either music or in this case it's the sound of the crickets underneath it. Uh, and so it's all happening happening, uh, it, there's action. And that's another reason why I think I, I'm allowed perhaps 30 seconds of explaining coral reproduction, because we're on location. Michael Pollan, who's the food writer, um, who's written all sorts of wonderful books, including The Omnivore's Dilemma. In The Omnivore's Dilemma, there's this chapter where he's talking about corn, and he starts the chapter by sitting down next to a, a corn farmer on a tractor, and they're driving around the field harvesting the corn. So he tells you so much about corn in that chapter, but it's kind of all taking place inside that tractor. And so that's, that is a, it's a technique that you can use to kind of place people in a location. And the idea that you, that you then communicate, so in this case about coral reproduction, it has a kind of physical home in your head. In this case, the physical home is graveyard adjacent. Okay, so then now it's time they gather up all the equipment and they're wading out into the water. The next thing that I wanted to say is that you hear my voice, I'm kind of talking into the mic. So there's me narrating where I'm like, I'm standing here with, you know, where I'm reading lines of narration that I've written. But then there's all the stuff that I'm just speaking into the microphone like a diary. And so you'll hear that uh, kind of me going back and forth here uh, in the next short section. Go along underneath the stars with Richard Ross a biologist with the California Academy of Sciences. Sprinkled out all around are little patches of coral colonies. Under the water, it's just a constant safari. You hope you're going to see the coral spawning, and you never know if it's even going to happen. So I like, being, I like narrating while I'm in the field for a couple reasons. One, it, it allows me to become a character in the piece, like I'm not just kind of an omniscient uh, narrator or reporter. I'm actually a, a person who was interacting with the people. And the other reason is that when I'm making observations, like, wow, look at all these, it's like, uh, you know, I, I'm talking about what I'm seeing. I'm seeing people wading out into the water. There's a, you can only in that moment can you capture in your voice 
the emotion of what, of what it is you are looking at or experiencing. And this was a very kind of, I, I feel like there's a kind of reverence. I mean, it's really, it's, it's dark, there are stars in the sky, it's calm, you see these like dark figures waiting out. And that, even though I'm not saying all that, is hopefully conveyed through my voice. Um, the other reason I wanted to play this clip is that I've reported on a lot of environment stories, a lot of biodiversity stories and climate stories, and I think a lot about uh, what, which of the stories I want to tell now. Um, and one of the filters that I use is, is when I hear a story and I'm like, wow, that's really interesting. I, haven't, I hadn't heard of that before. Um, and, and it makes me curious to learn more. In this case, when I heard about, I was going to Guam, uh, which is in the tropical Pacific, for a conference, and I then thought, well, let me see if I can find some story that's happening there. And when I heard about the fact that there was going to be, during that same week, completely coincidentally, a big spawning event uh, just offshore, and they were going to try to capture these uh, sperm and eggs and do IVF for corals, I thought, well, that I'd never heard of before, and that's very interesting. And in that whole story, there is some real hope, you know, because clearly corals aren't doing well, but tucked inside this story is a group of people that's doing something active to make a difference. So, um, so I want to play for you now the very end of the story. So uh, in the kind of intervening period, I kind of wait around, and we're, walk, you know, we're waiting for the corals to spawn, nothing's happening, I talk to a couple of people, and then finally uh, we get spawning. We've got a whole slick going on. Those little white dots that are yeah. kind of swirling around? Exactly. Looks like kind of the Milky Way. Yeah. Hey, you came on a good night. Only problem is, it's the wrong species. The spawn's from the big Parides boulder corals, and the team doesn't have the right equipment to collect it. Dirk Peterson admits defeat. Patient, tomorrow's another night. <laughs> the next night, they bring the right equipment, but there's not enough spawn. The following night, they try a different location, but again, not enough. The spawning window has closed. It's part of what makes the work so difficult. How many of you have done field work? And how many times does it go exactly as you intended and you write it up? Never. It never goes according to plan. And it's the same thing in journalism. I pitched a story to my editor saying I'm going to go to Guam during the week of spawning and I'm going to be in the water during the magical moment when sperm and egg flow out into the water and they gather them up and rush them to shore and they fertilize them and it, it'll, it'll, it's going to be a beautiful little radio movie that I'm going to make. But I go there and we're waiting and then this happens. It's like day after day they're not getting them, they don't have the right equipment. And then I'm like, okay, you guys going to do it again? You know, because I'm looking for tape. And they're like, yeah, we're going to go further up the island and we're going to go offshore. You can't join us because we actually have to dive down. So I'm like, all right, I'll be waiting on the beach for you when you return victorious, having collected the spawn. So I'm waiting around. It's night. Nice. There's like nobody there. They've all left. They've gone in. And then finally I like see them, you know, like emerging out of the depths of the water and they come out. And I can, but they're not, they're not like this, you know, they're like, they're like this. So they didn't get it, you know, just over and over and over again. They're not getting it. So I realized I was going to, if I didn't do something, I was going to go home, come back here without an ending to the story. Because the whole thing is building towards IVF. And I wasn't getting the IVF. So, um, so then I talked to one of the researchers, Lori Raimundo, who you didn't hear from, but she appears in the middle part of the piece. And she told me that this wasn't the first time that CCOR, this group, had been out. They'd been out before, and they had established a little coral nursery where they had successfully uh, placed uh, little recruits that they were going to uh, plant out onto the reef. So I asked her, is there any way I can go visit that place, ideally with somebody who knows what they're talking about? And she said, yes. Before leaving Guam, I paddle a kayak 1,200 feet from shore underneath a fiery sunset sky. Nicole Burns, a grad student at the University of Guam, kicks her way down to a coral nursery below me. And when she surfaces, bobbing beside me, she's holding a small cement pyramid in her hand with a staghorn the size of a crouton growing on its surface. 
It's a baby, baby coral. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It looks like a little baby, too. It's light in color, and it's you know, got a little pink on it. This baby's two years old and came from spawn collected at sea and fertilized on shore. It's been growing in the nursery ever since, cared for by burns, among others. We tend to them, and then once they're big enough, then you plant them out to be in nature and in the wild. The next day, this baby will be placed on a reef farther up the coast, where everyone's hoping it'll grow up to stand guard against an uncertain future. So that was the ending. Uh, you know, when, uh, when I first started doing radio, uh, I used to, I, I, I tried to get people into soundproof chambers. Get it quiet. Shut the things off. I don't want any interruptions from, from anything in the environment. But I have come to realize that, that, scene, that you know, sound and scene can really help uh, flesh out and bring a, bring a story to life. Uh, and so in this case, I love that you hear Nicole like she's not, she's breathing in a way that you wouldn't normally breathe if you're sitting down with someone in an office. She's treading water next to the kayak, holding this thing above her head. So she, she's breathing in a different way. So I love that. I love that, that how real that sound is and how on location it is. Um, I'm going to play for you now a short excerpt from a different story. This comes from the middle of a piece. I reported a story in Iceland a couple years ago, a year ago, you know, I don't know. It was one or two years ago, uh, and it was about uh, an ocean current. Basically, it's a it's a it's a ribbon of water that flows south-ish, basically from between Greenland and Iceland, and it seems to be an important part of the global overturning circulation, the conveyor belt of water uh, that flows through the world's oceans. Uh, but they don't know how it's formed, and so there's there was a group of scientists that was going out onto a ship, and also they were flying in the air not the same scientists, different scientists, and they were converging in the same spot to try to measure the, 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 the wind and the water and the weather to figure out how this current was forming. And the hypothesis is that it's formed when you basically get really bad cold storms that blow over the Greenland ice sheet and chill the water in this region and sink it down to depth. So the point here is that bad weather is what they think is, cause, is creating this current. The story opens, and I'm with a scientist, and we're talking, and he's pointing to the current off in the distance. I mean, you can't see it, but he's just, you know, he's like, if you go out there, go out the fjord, make a right, and take a long time in a boat, you'll eventually find it below you. So we're talking about the current and why it's important and all that stuff I just set up, because it's, all, it's also important to the climate. And then uh, we need to transition, we need to get to the boat. <clears throat> and, uh, and then this, this part of the, then this happens. We walk through a nasty cold rain along the tiny streets of Isafjord towards the ship that'll take the cart out to sea. But for him, the weather's not quite nasty enough. Oh, you want oh, we snow want, and we ice? Want, we want sub-freezing temperatures. The colder, the better. A minute later, Picard gets his wish. The rain becomes a driving sleet. Oh, yes. But the miserable weather is why Picard's here, as he explains when we finally reach the ship. So we are in the North Atlantic storm track. Okay, so that is just basically getting from the, sh the street corner where we were onto the ship. And gloriously, the weather whipped up into a frenzy and pelted us, and I had to stick my microphone in my jacket because it was just way too wet and cold. But that is exactly the point of why they're there. They're looking for bad weather. So it's a way of, uh, you've probably heard this, you, you want to, in storytelling, you show, you don't tell. Ideally, you show, don't tell. Because if, if you tell, that's a bit more lectury. And um, uh, showing, you can just, you, you don't have to do it. You just like illustrate it. Just say, see, there's bad weather. And then the bad weather gets us, in, gets us onto the ship where, uh, Bob Picard can talk to us about uh, about how what what they think how this weather might be creating the deep current. Okay, uh, so those are a couple of audio examples. I want to play a, a rather different example. This is a um, video that I worked on uh, with a friend and collaborator Amanda Kowalski for an organization called Bird Note. 
you know, they're essential tools for birding. They're your binoculars, your spotting scope, your field guide. And if you're black, you're going to need probably two or three forms of ID. Never wear a hoodie. Ever. The word for an African American in camouflage is incognito. Blackbirds are your birds. Red winged blackbirds, grackles, rusty blackbirds, brewers blackbirds, black scoters, you claim black brant, crows, ravens, and blackbirds are largely maligned. Any bird that's black is my bird. You know, the edge of day is light is fading. Those crepuscular hours are the times when many birds come to life. It's such a beautiful time to bird. But if you're a black birder and you're going to bird at night, you better be careful because you might be perceived as being up to no good. Be prepared to be confused with the other black birder. When I meet another black birder, it's like encountering an ivory-billed woodpecker, an endangered species. Extinction looms. These are the rules for the black birder. We have to do something to make birding, to make nature study in general, more interesting to people of color. Out of every hundred bird watchers, how many are black? Five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
one that, uh, in retrospect, I don't find particularly interesting. Uh, the, the, the general arc of this type of story goes as follows. Uh, let me tell you about a species you've never heard of in a place you may never visit. It's not doing so well, and turns out you're to blame. There's a small group of people that are doing something to try to help things, but it's probably too late, and the species is going to crash. That is a usual, and that's the way this, this story kind of flows. I mean, you hear it at the beginning, out of sight, out of mind. I mean, who, who seagrasses? I mean, really, it's like, who, who's, who's really into this at this moment? Probably not a lot of people. So I, I, had, I was working on this story for two different places. One was the story that aired on The World, and then the, another was for a podcast that I was working on called One Species at a Time um, that was with a group called the Encyclopedia of Life. And I had a different editor on that project, uh, Jay Allison, and Jay uh, listened, I, I played him this version, and he said, he basically told me what I just told you. He's like, yeah, I, I feel like, like I've heard this story before. Not this exact story, but a story much like it. And the problem with having felt like you've heard a story before is then you stop paying attention. So the whole point is like, you, ho you want people to pay attention. So how might you get them? So he's like, you got anything else? Any, you know, can you do anything else with the story? And um, what was interesting is that while I was, report so I ended up reporting the story over a long time. Um, I was in Barcelona, or near Barcelona, and I went out with the crew, and, um, and I interviewed everybody, and we talked about the seagrasses. And then I had to go back, basically, to interview a fisherman, because this, this kind of nonprofit is working with fishermen to help conserve the, the seagrasses. So I was going back a year later, and in that year, one of the lead characters in the story, Alex Lorente, died. Young guy. Um, I forget how old I'll say it in the next clip. I, I think he was in his early 30s. He died, um, actually, while being out in this, in this water. Um, and I had mentioned this to my first editor, and I think, you know, first of all, there's no one right way to tell a story. There are lots of ways to tell a story. Um, but my first editor, he, he thought it would be too much to go into, uh, if I mentioned Alex in the piece, I'd have to explain how, like, what happened to him. You can't just introduce him and not say that he passed away. And my editor said, you know, really the focus should be on this habitat and on this seagrass. So we eliminated Alex entirely from the first version. Jay said, what if you focused the entire piece around Alex instead? And so this is the beginning of that story. This story begins with a man who devoted himself to an ecosystem and an organism and it ends with his death, a loss that came all too early when he was only 37 years old. His name was Alex Lorente, and we met back in the summer of 2011 in Les Dartites, a picture postcard Spanish town up the coast from Barcelona. Lorente and I were on board. So the story actually is starting, like we're, we're getting to the same place, but in a very different way. We're introducing it with a character, with a person, instead of with the seagrass small boat with a couple of his colleagues from Submon, a marine conservation group. We headed towards one of the scrubby Medes Islands in the Mediterranean. Our boat stopped just offshore. Lorente peered over the side. Today the visibility is very good. From the boat we can see the bottom and now we take a look uh, underwater. One of Lorente's colleagues, marine biologist Jordi Sanchez, put on his mask and dunked his head underwater. So now I have, so now we're, we're the, the, the story is about Alex, and Alex actually cares so much for these seagrasses. And so now I spend the next few minutes talking about how devoted Alex has been to those seagrasses. So it's, 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 ho the hope is that someone listening will care about Alex, and in so doing, care more about the thing he cared about than if I just open with the seagrasses that people don't have a connection to. And then this is the very end of that story. So we, we eventually, we learn about the connection to the fisherman, and this is, um, Sakane is the, is the fisherman uh, who I interviewed for the story. Fisherman like Miquel Sacané. Yo creo que una persona clave en el proceso fue Alex, Alex Lorente. He says that a key person who built the necessary trust between scientists and fishermen was Alex Lorente. In fact, it was Lorente who put me in touch with Sacané, 
and Sakane, who told me in the late summer of 2012 that Lorente had passed away. Lorente was out one evening near the Medes Islands with a group free diving, which means no air tanks or scuba gear. On his last surfacing, he fainted and sank back into the water. A search team was dispatched immediately, but they couldn't find him. And when the current got too strong later that night, the swimmers were evacuated. The next day, they found Lorente's body, only 50 yards from the spot where he disappeared. Fisherman Mikel Sacané. He says that Lorente's character, his ability to relate to people of all walks of life, isn't something he learned. It's something that was just part of him. Sacané says one of his favorite memories of Lorente was watching his face light up when something succeeded, whether it was restoring a patch of underwater habitat or reconciling the differences between two groups of people. And as one obituary pointed out, Alex Lorente died in the very spot he lived to protect, in the very waters that remain home to the Posidonia that attracts all the people and animals he cherished. So this is an important point. I, <clears throat> I spent less time in this version of the story talking about the seagrass than I did in the, version, the first version. But I would suspect, and I have not done any sort of like A-B testing on this, I would suspect that people would remember more about the seagrass in the second version. So even though there's less like information per unit time about the seagrass, the fact that Alex is there provides uh, he, he's, he, what, what he's doing essentially is holding your hand with this one and he's touching the seagrass here. And by doing that, he's providing the linkage. And so in the storytelling, my goal is to try to bring Alex to life as much as possible and then towards the end, bring his passing to life as much as possible. So in, in, along this line of thinking of um, how you can communicate more science by telling, by, by saying less about the science, which is, seems counterintuitive. I wanted to tell you about an um, uh, uh, organization that I do some work for called Story Collider. Um, it is, it's a bit, so it's a live storytelling show where we get people up on stage, scientists and civilians alike, uh, to talk about some personal true story that uh, connects to science somehow. And um, we do these shows, so it's, the group started in New York. Uh, I'm, I co-produced the show here in Boston. We have shows in 14 cities now across the world, in Canada, New Zealand, and then a bunch in the US. Um, and uh, the regular shows, and then lots of shows elsewhere. Uh, and our next show is Tuesday, I think it's a Tuesday, July 9th. Uh, here in Boston at the Oberon Theater in Harvard Square. Um, we get five tellers up on stage and all the stories kind of revolve around a theme. And the, the point is to get, ideally, if folks are willing, for folks to kind of be vulnerable and tell their story on stage. And we work with the tellers in advance to get their stories into shape for the show. So this is the venue at the Oberon. They set it up kind of cabaret style um, and they've got that great, red velvet curtain on stage. Uh, and um, I want to play you a clip from Nina Dudnick, who told a, a story on our stage a few years ago. Uh, and this comes at the end of her story, where she basically talks about, the after graduating from college, how um, the kind of journey she went on to feel like she, like she felt kind of um, without a home. You know, she was wandering around trying to find out where she might fit. Uh, she did half a year in Italy working on a, an, a, some agronomy projects and then ended up in the Ivory Coast also working on, agro uh, on agronomy. So this, comes at, this, is, this is the last two minutes of her story. And that's how I ended up with this group in the village of Mayantua. It's on the border between Liberia and the Ivory Coast. You can't really even get there in the rainy season. We get to this village and the people that I'm with slip into this dialogue of sort of heavy agronomy subjects with the farmers. And not only are they speaking in, about a science that I'm only just becoming familiar with, half the time they're doing it, they're doing it in this local language, Yakuba, which I obviously do not speak. And so while they're sitting there learning agronomy, I befriended everybody under the age of 10. 
So there's groups of little boys sitting right there, and we're making silly faces at each other, and little girls are coming up to pick at my freckles to see if they come off, pull at my hair to see if it's a weave. This little toddler climbs in my lap. I've got like a whole fan club. And the chief of the village stands up at the end of the day and says, thank you expressly to me for having traveled such a long way to just come and be with them in their village and invites us back the next day. That last afternoon in the village of Mantua, when we were getting ready to leave, the chief of the village stood up and he said, we were talking last night about the history of the village and we remembered. We remembered that there was a baby girl who was born and she was taken very far away from the village. And we realized when we saw you yesterday that today that daughter of the village had been returned to us. And so one by one, as I started to just bawl my eyes out, they introduced me to my village mother and my village father and my aunts and my uncles and this vast array of cousins. They gave me a chicken and a sack of rice. And just before they blessed the road for my journey home, they gave me a name, Namaya. In Yakuba, what it means is the child has rediscovered her family. Thank you. Nina talked in her story. The story is eight to ten minutes long. She talked a little bit about the science, but most of the story, we actually tell people to delete a lot of the, the science information. Mostly these are personal stories, and the science kind of hitches a ride on the personal arc. Um, you know, every story is different. People talk about relationships with family members, with themselves. Uh, and often, not always, but often folks will say that the process of going through telling that story uh, can be a kind of act of catharsis, can be a healing act, um, and it's one that I feel really proud to be a part of. So we've got a podcast, storycollider.org. You can find out about upcoming shows, listen to the podcast, or come to a live show, as I say, on Tuesday, July 9th. Uh, okay, last clip before I take questions, and this um, is from, uh, this is from uh, this is a project I worked on at NOVA. And we have a platform called Nova Labs, which is our online gaming platform, where we take a topic area and we find a way to kind of gamify it. Uh, the intended audience are middle school and high schoolers and lifelong learners. It's really anyone, uh, but it's aimed at that kind of like 7th to 12th grade range. Um, and I, this was a couple years ago, I produced something called the Evolution Lab with a team at Nova, uh, where we took an existing kind of... Um, a little bit like an interactive uh, build-your-own phylogenetic tree that a, a, a learning lab at Harvard had built. And we had to figure out how do we tell a story about evolution uh, that is going to be kind of like a game with different levels that increase in complexity but introduce themes that are important for people and for students to learn. Uh, so I wanted to play for you the trailer here. And this was just a very different... Um, way of thinking about storytelling uh, because there were like little stories tucked inside each of the levels uh, and then the larger overall story that we were trying to tell with the lab. Everywhere you go on this planet, on land, underground, in the air, and in the water, there's more and more life to be found. And all of it, even you, is shaped by the most incredible of forces, evolution. In Nova's Evolution Lab, you'll be climbing around the tree of life. Learn the basics from our videos, then work your way through six missions using physical traits and DNA to build out portions of the tree. Use the evidence for evolution, like fossils and where species live on Earth today, to figure out how organisms are related. Use the tree of life to battle disease, save someone's life, and probe the origins of humanity. Then conduct your own research with Deep Tree, a massive interactive tree containing over 70,000 species, each one a story of life on Earth. Play this lab, build the tree of life, which is your family tree, and discover just how connected you are to everything that's alive and everything that's ever lived. Okay, I'm going to end there, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions. That was wonderful. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Ari. 
I had so many questions, but I'm just going to ask one or two. Um, so my first question is, how do you decide what is a good story? How do you determine yeah. it's going to sell, for lack of a better word? And second, can you tell us how you think about the audience when you're putting together the story? Do you have somebody in mind, or h how does that work? Yeah, thanks, Coco. <clears throat> how do you pick a good story? Well, um, I, you know, perhaps a good example I can use is from Story Collider. Because uh, when, we, when we sometimes do the first call, so we worked with a storyteller about a year ago named Moni Avello, who, um, who I saw give a short three-minute talk about her research. And she, it was so great that I, I approached her after. I said, I wonder if you might be interested in telling a story in Story Collider. She's like, yeah, that'd be great. And so then we got on the phone, but we had nothing really to go off of. So we were kind of like kicking around ideas. And she mentioned that her younger sister uh, has autism and that that had been a struggle uh, within her family for her and for her parents uh, throughout her life. Um, but when she was telling us about it, it was very much like, uh, it, it was a lot of like, it was just a lot of telling, you know? So here, here's, here's what happened. And, and I, so I think, so the first thing is that when thinking about finding a story, you can imagine like a, like a block of clay or a marble, you know, I'm not comparing myself to Michelangelo, but he used to say that, um, or so I've heard, maybe it's apocryphal, that the, that the form was inside the rock, and his job was to liberate it. So he'd chip away all the stuff that didn't matter, and he was left with this gorgeous object. And in some ways, that's kind of what we do. We, you know, we know that it's in there somewhere, and we go around, you know, at first we use harsher tools to get rid of the big stuff, and then start finer brushes once we kind of zero in on what that thing is. But a lot of it, with Story Collider is discovering what that story is along with the teller. So we knew then that Moni's story was going to focus around her relationship with her sister and, and her sister's autism. But then we needed to find scenes, very much like what I did with the choral story, but scenes that exemplified the moments in Moni's life that, um, that showed how she was feeling. So she opens with a story of her being in a restaurant. She's like, I'm in this restaurant with my parents and sister, and they're sitting down, and at some point, something goes wrong, and her sister, it's like the seating arrangement isn't to her sister's liking, and her sister starts wailing or shrieking, and then you see all of her family members react in a different way. Her mom, um, who you know, goes up and is like, shh, please don't, you know, just quiet down, quiet down. And her dad is this larger, you know, like ex-military guy who's like, we are not tolerating. He grabs her and he takes her out. And then she's like, and there, like not being paid attention to is me. And so, so that, but Moni had to kind of discover what the exact right anecdote moment was to open with. And so with her, it really was talking through, okay, then, but then where does the story go after that? And after that, and where do you want to end the story? So, 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 the, overall, I sort of knew that Moni had a good storytelling like sense, and it was about working through with her what that is. Otherwise, you know, if it's in a radio story or a video story, then it's 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 more like, well, what's interesting? What's surprising? We worked on a project at Nova um, that just concluded where we were where we were trying to connect what was going on in the news with science, and so news is always happening, and so we'd have to kind of figure out, well, what news stories are interesting, not too political, maybe a little bit, but you know, most of them were not, and how do they connect to science? And so that was just sort of a useful exercise to see what was happening. So when the Boeing 737 MAX 8 crashed um, in Ethiopia, we did a video on that and some text reporting around that. So sometimes news will motivate a story. Other times it'll be like in the case of the corals, it's just something really interesting that I found that I want to share with other people. Audience, I would say, you know, I, 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 I think I'm, it's mostly I think about me as a, as, a, as a surrogate for an audience member. So I think about someone who's curious, like maybe more than vaguely curious, less than extremely curious, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, and someone who's got a little bit of time to sit down and listen or maybe they're not sitting down and listening, they're doing dishes and listening, or sit down and watch something. You know, so that, that's sort of who I have in mind. You know, for the labs, we're gearing it towards that 7th to 12th grade group. So, um, but usually I, I'm imagining me, then I just imagine me as a 12th grader or as a 10th grader. 
Yeah, I, I don't actively think about it, but I use myself as like a proxy for maybe what I find interesting. Yeah. That's really fantastic. Um, I'm so curious, and I think about this a lot when I'm teaching too, um, when you think about presenting uh, material that's very difficult. And yeah. As you say, it can either be um, overly, maybe too overly scientific or overly depressing. You know, here's yeah. a species that's gone, nothing we can do. Um, or, or you can present it in a way that's much more entertaining, but often there, there might be a fear that you're, you're losing the edge. And we're in this moment now where you know, Bill McKibben is saying, it's time to panic. Greta Thunberg is going to Parliament and said, you, you failed to act. How do you balance that? Are you ever tempted to, like, I don't want this to be too comfortably entertaining because it's not telling, it's not actually transmitting the message. You know, today part of Antarctica collapsed an ice shelf and a whole colony of penguins was lost, like a gigantic colony. If you were to do a story on that, how do you tell that story that's engaging without it being like, oh my God, I'm, I can't listen to this. I'm going to listen to something else. I'm going to shut down. It's yeah, I mean, I think, I think around environment issues, it's challenging because, you know, that folks have these <clears throat> they, you know, they'll be like, oh, here, com here it comes, here comes this sad news story because, you know, I've, I've heard it. And then they, they, and they'll shudder, they'll put up a kind of shuddering around themselves. So that, that's where I think the, the, the personal narrative and story can be really effective. As stories that don't start with the, you know, the, 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 the glacier, or sorry, the, the part of the ice sheet um, calving off. Um, but bring people in in a different way to hopefully get them to care about to care about something. You know, I mean, these these are these are small things. If there's like a thing that someone can do, you know, stories are often a useful like is it antecedent it comes before you know before the kind of call to action. Um, it's useful. I mean, community organizers use storytelling very effectively, where you where you you you, you take a person whose story kind of um, is um, is representative of the larger group. It's like a class action lawsuit, you know, often brought forth by kind of one person or a small group of people who kind of tell the story of the larger group. I mean, I, I lean into, into story very heavily. I think humor can also be effectively deployed. Um, there's a great show called You're the Expert. It's a live show where uh, um, a, a comedian and educator has three stand-up comedians who interview an expert about a topic. And it's great because it's, it's very entertaining. And again, I don't think, I think entertainment doesn't need to be, uh, you know, it's not either entertainment or interesting or, or informative, enter, entertainment or serious. I actually think you can be quite serious while still be being entertaining and, and funny. And, and uh, you're the expert, Chris's show does a beautiful job of that. So there are, different, there are different approaches, but I think ultimately going back to audience, you know, it's like if you, if you could trial the, the one-liner on an, on, an, on an audience member who's representative of the group you're trying to reach, and you notice them like, oh, okay, I don't want to, then, then, you, then you try something else. So, and I think there are, and there, people learn in different ways, and so some folks are going to want to read a comic book or watch a dance or, you know, hear a podcast. It really, it really depends. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, do you ever get stuck when you're creating these stories? And or I'm, yeah, I'm sure that comes along. And how do you work through that? And do you shift the story, or how do you kind of work through that, so to speak, writer's block? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, well, there are different there are different approaches to this. Um, Someone, a colleague, uh, talks about uh, just, he calls it a barf draft, where you just like, you know, and it's not good at first. And, uh, and, he'd, he, and he'll write the whole thing like that. I, I've tried that approach on certain sections. of Like sometimes I'll hit a point where I'm like, okay, I know I got to do something on this, and then I'll just write bad words down, not, not like, cuss words, but you know, like, I'll write uh, poor, poor words down, you know, words that aren't going to be the best choice of words. But it's often easier to edit a bad thing than to write a great thing initially. So, um, so that's, that's what I, I'll do. I'll like write a bad thing and then revise and try to get it, get it better. 
Um, other times, I'll just take a break from it entirely um, and sometimes go on a walk and think through. Usually, I had an editor early on at The World, David Barron, who's phenomenal, and what he drove home to me is like thinking about the structure of a story. So, and, 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 and thinking about what that structure might be before you even record your first uh, bit of tape. Uh, that's a, that's a mix of, bit, bit of uh, you know, digital audio onto your recorder. And so knowing what that structure is in advance, so I knew the structure of the choral story, but then it fell apart, so then I had to come up with a new structure. But then once I got home, I sort of knew like, okay, I'm opening at the graveyard. And that kind of helps. And I found actually that, you, that leaning on narrative um, and, and with scene, and I've done some written articles like this too, that often is like, it's a, it's a way to ease into the story. I find it way harder to start a story with like, what, what's like the fact that's gonna get people, like I usually don't start with a fact. I start with, uh, with, a, with an opening line, you know, like um, I just wrote a story about a, a graduate student um, who, uh, when she was a little girl at the age of six, she, she built a, robot, a robotic dog. But it wasn't, like, but then, like, she told me it wasn't a real robotic dog, it was a cardboard box, and she just threw nuts and bolts and circuit boards in, she shook it around, and she really wanted it to come to life because she wanted a companion because she was lonely as a girl, because her interests in engineering weren't mirrored by her, by her peers. So that is then a way into, so, you know, I, that for me was a good place to start. It starts early on in her life. It was a profile piece, and then it kind of opens up this other avenue. So it's funny because sometimes I feel like I'm cheating by putting all the narrative stuff in, which I find like really fun to write about. It's not really, it's not fiction because it's real, but it's almost it's like narrative nonfiction. It, it's it's a little bit easier to write, and um, and yet I find that's often a way to kind of move forward. And if I'm really stuck, then maybe then maybe I just need to you know. Maybe, I'm, I, maybe I've hit like a dead end in the maze, and I'm like, you know what? Maybe that's not the direction I need to go in, and I need to pivot. So, but often, like going for a walk, sleeping on it, thinking about the overall structure helps. So I have a quick question. Yeah. So when I think of uh, narrative and information being coupled, I think of Silent Spring as someone mm -hmm. who did beautiful yeah, narrative right, and, right. and in beautiful information. I'm wondering if you have a, a hero or heroine that, that you've leaned on as you've approached this world of narrative and science that you would want to share with us? Yeah, it's a great, yeah, I mean, a few come to mind. Um, and editors, you know, and actually that's another, sometimes if I get really stuck, I'll lean on an editor. Um, I, I mentioned a couple of these folks already. David Barron, who was my editor at, at The World, he wrote a gorgeous book called Beast in the Garden about the influx of mountain lions into the Boulder area. And he, I mean, that book is so beautifully done. I mean, it reads like a detective story because it opens with a murder, which you think is a murder. A guy, well, of course, you know, you probably, you, you probably think it has something to do with mountain lions because on the cover there's a mountain lion. But basically this guy, this runner, has been sliced open in the middle and his organs have been eaten. And, uh, you know, and the whole book is like figuring out, well, then, then it becomes clear it's a mountain lion, but how did the mountain lions work up the chutzpah to take down a to take down a runner, and the kind of the the battle that ensued. He's one that I'd point to. I mean, Jay Allison taught me a ton about narrative. I mean, I mentioned that one example with Alex Lorente, but there was another story I was working on with Muskox, and I gave him the the, the the story. I read it through for him. He's like, I think it actually begins. At, your story begins at the bottom of page one. You know, just cast aside everything that came before it. He, he, he worked with me a lot uh, on you know, developing storytelling. Um, I mean, the folks at Radio Lab, I listened to their show a lot early on. Jad Abumrad and Robert Krolwich are both, you know, I think, real, real masters of that genre. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd say those are a collection of people. Yeah. Wonderf Hi. Great to see you. Nice Wonderful you presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Uh, asking really a follow-up question. I see a lot of students in the audience who are interested in, in, uh, yeah. in the power story and yeah. what, going forward with the power, power story. What would you recommend they read or study to build up the power of story in their own narrative? Yeah, well, I would say um, uh, you should just start doing it. Uh, I mean, you could, you, it, certainly you probably all have consumed at least one book in your life. So you've, you've, you've read, you've watched movies, you've listened to stuff. Think about those types of things that you really like spending time watching and listening to and reading. 
um, and then start making it. Uh, you know, and you can do that in both unstructured and structured ways. On the unstructured side, you know, you you have in your hands with your phones the ability to record audio at a at a very high quality and record video at a high quality. So you can start just trying to make your own podcast, make your own video, write your own blog entry, and put it up online. Um, if you want to post audio, there's a site called PRX that stands for the Public Radio Exchange. It's kind of like a clearinghouse for independent radio content that stations from all over the country will go to to look for uh, stories and sometimes put on their air. But it's just a good place to kind of put it up and, and try. Um, but the more that you do it, the more, the, the better you're going to get. And early on, like I once made the mistake of not previewing an early clip of mine. I'm like, I'm going to play one of the first stories I ever made. And I hadn't listened to it ahead of time. And then I started playing it and I got seven seconds in and it was bad. It was really bad. But you, you, I mean, invariably, unless, unless you're like, a, you know, you, you've, uh, you're just sort of born with this innate ability, most people start off bad. You know, and you got to work into being good. I mean, Ira Glass talks about that. Like he, he's like you, you. He's like I, he, Ira Glass, who you know, the host of uh, creator of This American Life. He's like I sucked for a really long time, and I had to work through that until I got to the point where I didn't suck as bad. And you just get better and better. Surrounding yourself with people who like the craft and who can give you good feedback is also important. Um, so being in, uh, you know, so we've got a, a monthly meetup here in Boston called the Sonic Soiree, where radio producers get together and talk about craft and share their story and get feedback from people. Um, there are similar groups that do that. There's a science writer meetup uh, called, called Swanakama, science writers in and around Cambridge. Um, on the structured side of things, there are internships you can do. We do internships at, um, at NOVA. Uh, we, I have an intern, a former intern in the audience. Uh, uh, we do inter internships at NOVA every spring, summer, and fall semester for current students. They're not paid, um, unfortunately, but, um, but that's an opportunity to just sort of like get your, your hands dirty and try working on these things. Um, you know, reaching out to people who, reporters, authors, creators of this content whose work you admire uh, and kind of, uh, you know, asking them about their path and what they would advise, and asking them to give you feedback on an early story is, uh, is, is also helpful. Um, so I'm happy to go into more specifics with folks afterwards if, you're, you, know, if you want to think about that. But, but that's, that's what I would suggest. I think just trying it and making it. And, and you know, even though early on, I should, I should say that even though early on, I, I, like I've gotten better. You know, I mean, I wasn't like terrible at the beginning, but I've gotten better. But even early on, there was something about making it that I, and still now, that I loved. Getting to be it, w working with that stuff, the, the voices and the, and the images, I really love doing. And so if, you're, if you are enjoying playing with audio, playing with words, and that feels fun, then, that, then you know, just do a little bit more of that and try it out. And, um, and you know, and I think that it, it could lead you into, you know, positive directions. Well, we should probably stop there. So let's okay. thank Ari one more time. My let's pleasure. Thank, thank you for having me. I'm just going to make a perfect a plug right here. So the X College is offering a course the second session, Podcasting for Change. This sounds really fascinating, so if anybody's interested in learning more about that, you can check it out on the X College website. Summer course. Yeah.